Welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we already heard from Arjun earlier today about cosmic rays and a bit about the highest energy neutrinos. My talk is going to be about neutrinos. And, and when I say neutrinos, I mean high energy, uh, the ones that we have seen so far in Ice Cube, and then ultra high energy, the ones that we want to see in the next 10 years. So uh, it's been an exciting few years for high energy astrophysical neutrinos. We, we started more than 10 years ago not even having these TeV to PeV neutrinos that we now have. Uh, there were only predictions. Then in 2013, IceCube, I'm going to say more about IceCube later, detected the first PEV neutrinos. Remember, PEV is 10 to the 15 electron volts. And uh, since then, and fairly recently, we have hints for the first sources of these neutrinos, and we're doing the first test of neutrino physics at the highest energies. In 10 to 20 years from now, we want to transform this field in order to be uh, a more high precision field for testing neutrino physics with PEV neutrinos. Not only that, we want to discover EEV neutrinos with a thousand times uh, the energies that we have seen so far. And the question is, how do we get from today to 20 years from now? And, and I'm partially going to, to, to tell you some of the paths that will lead us there. All right, so let's, let's settle down and see where we are. Uh, as you know, neutrinos are, are ubiquitous and span about 20 orders of magnitude in energy, all of that. Uh, and the, in the y-axis, you see flux of neutrinos times uh, two powers of the energy. And these are all the non-anthropogenic uh, neutrino sources. So uh, on the far end at the lowest energies, these are the relic neutrinos. They're abundant, but they're very low energy. So we haven't detected them so far. Um, and then at the MeV to GeV to TeV range, these are all the usual suspects. Uh, we have the, the solar neutrinos from all the, all the chains. Uh, supernova neutrinos, we've seen only one instance of that, but we expect there to be a background that we're trying to detect. And then atmospheric neutrinos, which are produced when a uh, cosmic rays interact in the upper atmosphere and create neutrinos as part of the particle showers. And then at energies above TeV, we have what we call high energy neutrinos, TeV to PV energies. These are data points from a few years ago. And at even higher energies are the ultra high energy neutrinos, which we haven't seen so far and should presumably reach uh, thousands of PV or, or more in energy. Okay, my talk is going to be about these two. And uh, what is that makes uh, neutrinos at this energy exciting, uh, especially cosmic neutrinos? And again, uh, in, the y, in the x axis, we have neutrino energy. In the y axis, we have distance travel from the source of the neutrinos to the detector. And all the neutrinos that we have been studying for decades at this point, so reactor neutrinos, geoneutrinos, very short baseline neutrinos, solar, long baseline, short baseline, atmospheric, even supernova neutrinos, all of these are on the bottom left corner. So uh, low energies, short distances. Um, maybe supernovas have a longer distance, but that's the only exception. Uh, on the other hand, at the opposite end, the, at the highest energies and the longest travel distances, are the high energy neutrinos and the ultra high energy neutrinos that I've been talking about. Um, because they have the highest energies we've seen so far and the highest energy to expect for any neutrino to be made naturally, uh, we can test new physics at the highest energy scales, which we otherwise could not reach with, uh, let's say, neutrinos made by accelerators. And because they travel the longest distances, we can uh, probe even very small effects. So we are trying to look for a new physics effect that is individually small. Um, given the long baseline from the sources to the detector, these can accumulate and give an observable signal by the time that the flux of neutrinos reaches the Earth. That, those are the two reasons why these neutrinos are exciting. Not only that, from a practical perspective, uh, there's many experiments that are coming online or are being designed for the next decade, uh, all the way from the lowest to the highest energies. So the lowest energies you've seen some, some of you might be familiar with Juno and Super Capricande, Hyper Capricande, Dune, and then at the energies that are interesting for us, there's IceCube, uh, KM3 net, which is like IceCube and Mediterranean Sea, Baikal in Lake Russia. And then at the even highest energies, is a host of different experiments that are either running and going to be upgraded or totally new experiments that are going to be built. So in this regime where we have seen these neutrinos between TV and PEV, we expect to have more statistics and better reconstruction techniques, et cetera. Uh, at the highest energies, which we haven't detected so far, we expect a discovery if we're lucky. Uh, and then there's an interesting synergy between what we measure at oscillation experiments at low energies and what we can do with better measurements of those parameters uh, about high energy neutrino physics. All right, I'm gonna center again on those high energy and ultra high energy. And uh, some of you might come from a particle physics background and, and then the terminology is a bit different. So 
when I say high energy neutrinos in this talk, these are the ones that have been discovered, I mean TeV to PeV. When I say ultra high energy neutrinos, which have been predicted but not discovered, those are more than 100 PeV in energy. All right, again, uh, so I'm gonna talk about uh, high energy cosmic neutrinos, and that is one area of astroparticle physics. And, and there's two sides of the coin of astroparticle physics. On the one side, we use the observations of neutrinos, cosmic rays, gamma rays, gravitational waves, and try to learn something about the, the highest energy non-thermal sources of the universe, uh, which can look like something like that, a supermassive black hole, a blazer pointing at us, and, and particles being made in a jet, including neutrinos. On the other side of the coin, we have particle physics. Yeah. And in this case, we take the same observations, but now we try to learn about uh, fundamental physics, in particular in the neutrino sector, at, the, at energies that otherwise would be unreachable. And that includes a host of different possibilities, like measuring neutrino nucleon cross sections at energies far beyond what we can reach with accelerators, uh, looking at new neutrino neutrino interactions, uh, neutrinos scattered on galactic dark matter, neutrino decaying over very long distances, dark matter decaying to neutrinos, new interactions between electron and matter. Uh, Lorentz invariance violation in the neutrino sector and stellar neutrinos mixing with active neutrinos over long baselines. I'm not going to say, uh, I'm not going to touch upon in detail um, all of these, but I'm going to say a few things about some of these. Okay, uh, but before diving into specifics, uh, let, let's uh, take a closer look at what makes these neutrinos interesting to test new physics. And, and the general idea is that many uh, new physics effects grow as this, as some power of the neutrino energy N is model dependent uh, times the distance traveled from the sources to the detector and some coupling constant, which is again, model dependent. Uh, if you want to make this term, which is the new physics uh, term of equal size as the standard term that controls say neutrinos mixing and oscillating into one another as they travel, which we know is an effect that exists, then that means that this coupling over here must have a size at really tiny size, about four times 10 to the minus 47 in some units that depend on the, on the model. So that means that we can actually probe this size of, of effects, which is several orders of magnitude better that, than what we can probe using lower energy atmospheric neutrinos. So that's the power that, uh, that uh, high energy astrophysical neutrinos gives us, probing smaller couplings uh, compared to what we could do before. And we can do it, as I will show in, uh, later, uh, by a four, different neutrino observables, the spectral shape, uh, the angular distribution of the incoming neutrinos, the flavor composition, so then the amount of new E, new mu, new tau in the flux, and the timing or the arrival times between neutrinos and, and gamma rays and other signals. And we can do this today uh, in spite of all these quantities being very difficult to measure sometimes. Okay, so let's take stock of where we are and where we're heading. Uh, today we've seen TeV to PeV neutrinos. I'm gonna say more about this in a second. Uh, and we're turning those predictions that existed before the ice cube discovery uh, into data-driven tests. And we're doing also uh, is planning for the next decade where we have experiments that are being designed to test, uh, to discover 100 PV neutrinos. So we're doing it today. Uh, right, what is the story so far? Uh, let's, let's think about a toy model of neutrino, high energy neutrino production. And let's think about a generic source of, of uh, cosmic rays, like the ones that Arjun was showing earlier today, or some other uh, uh, undescribed source. Inside the source, uh, protons are trapped by magnetic fields. Think about 10 to the 12, the 10 to the 7 G uh, Gauss. It varies a lot because we don't know what the sources are. are. But they, they keep trapped, and uh, they get accelerated every time they, they cross a shock front. And in the end, they end up having some power load like any, uh, energy spectrum. And usually, this is e to the minus 2 coming from Fermi acceleration. And think, that, think about, about also the fact that this source might have a, a, a photon density inside, say, synchrotron photons emitted by electrons that are also co-accelerated with the protons. Um, and this typically looks like a power law, like a broken power law at some, with the breakage at some characteristic energy. Uh, because the, in some sources, the densities of the protons and the photons are high, then they interact about 50% of the time, they make a, a short-lived delta resonance, which promptly decays into either a, a proton at pi zero or a neutron at pi plus. And you can also have pi minuses by all the processes. Um, the pi zeros decay into gamma rays, and those gamma rays add to the gamma rays that we can see from electronic processes from the same source. While the pions, uh, the pi decays into a muon and a new mu, and then the muon further decays into a, a new mu bar 
and a new E. So in the end, we have two mu neutrinos. I'm not distinguishing between neutrinos and the neutrinos and per each electron neutrino produced. And uh, the, new, well, the neutrons that are created over here, uh, they are no longer confined magnetic magnetic fields, they're neutral, so they escape and then they beta decay into protons through propagation and they add to the cosmic rays that we see at Earth at the highest energies. Yes. You said you, you don't care about the neutrinos or antineutrinos, but if you were to care, this ratio would also be meaningful, like two to two, 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 one. Yeah, you expect something like that. Yeah. Okay. So because you, you would still have a pi minuses and they have the same decays, but the, the, the lepton numbers changed. The, but the uh, antineutrinos change for neutrinos, that's what I meant. You can have the same decay with, for, starting from a pi minus. You would get a, a new E bar, but also you would get a new mu and a new mu bar. So on average, there will be the same amount of yeah. antineutrinos than neutrinos. Yes, uh, to first order, yeah. Um, all right, and the energetics of this, three messengers, neutrinos, gamma rays, and cosmic rays, you can imagine they're linked. Uh, so the neutrino energy of each one of these is 5% of the parent proton energy over there. So you see neutrinos of one PEV, chances are that they, they, it was made by a proton interacting in the source that had about 20 PV of energy or so. And we know those exist because we measured, as you saw earlier, cosmic rays up to even higher energies. Very well. Okay, so that's about production. Uh, as I said, we don't know where what the sources are we know what the likely production process is but we don't know exactly where they're happening and i'm, I'm sure Kay is going to say something more about this later but let's imagine we have a population of sources let's say for the sake of the argument some active galactic nuclei distributed in redshift and uh, there's three points where these neutrinos can be made by processes like the ones i just showed uh, the first ones are when a, a the protons uh, and I should say protons and heavier nuclei interact with photons inside the sources by the processes I just showed, create a delta resonance, pi plus, et cetera, and then you get TV to PV neutrinos. So that happens when you have PV protons and roughly MEV photons interacting in the sources. And those are the neutrinos, which I'm gonna call high energy, remember, TV to PV that uh, IceCube has seen. Uh, they travel to the earth from a distribution that reaches roughly redshift of four or so. Uh, and, and all the way down to zero, of course. Uh, but this can also happen at, at different energies. So now if you have EEV neutrinos, remember before it was PEV, now it's EEV. Uh, so 10 to the 15 versus 10 to the 18 and, and lower energy photons, then you can actually produce higher energy neutrinos, EEV neutrinos, thousand times of uh, thousand PEV. And this is the same process, just different energetics. And, and not only that, but you can also make neutrinos along the way when you emit the cosmic rays from the sources. So now you have protons and heavy nucle heavier nuclei traveling, and then the, the target photon spectrum is no longer inside the source. It is rather the CMB or the extragalactic background light. And then you again get EEV neutrinos. And, and both the neutrinos that come, these cosmogenic neutrinos, that's, how, that's what we call them, uh, uh, that, that, that are coming from the interaction of the cosmic rays on the CMB and the neutrinos made by the same processes at these energies in the sources, we call them ultra high energy neutrino as opposed to high energy neutrinos. So that's the nomenclature. Uh, just bear in mind, we have seen these, and that's a, th these are the only ones that we have seen. We have not seen EEV neutrinos yet. All right, uh, so what do we have today in terms of experiments that detect TEV to PEV neutrinos? There are three of them. Uh, Antares is in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, Baikal is in, in Lake Baikal in Russia, and IceCube is in, in Antarctica. And out of the three of them, South, uh, IceCube is the biggest one. It's about one cubic kilometer of, of Antarctic ice. And it's the only one big enough so far to be able to see the flux of astrophysical neutrinos at, at, at those TV to TV energies. And all of these have upgrades that are coming and I'll say more about this later. But um, this is how IceCube looks on the top. Uh, this is just a counting house where all the electronics are. But uh, what, what first happens is, of course, underground. And about a kilometer and a half and two and a half kilometers, there are uh, strings of photomultipliers buried in the ice, about 5,000 photomultipliers. When a neutrino comes in, interacts, it interacts in the ice, occasionally it creates uh, a, a particle shower. The particle shower contains charged particles. They emit Cherenkov radiation. The light travels inside the, the ice and reaches and hits the PMTs and the light is collected. And then you reconstruct the energy, the direction, all of that from the light collected inside the detector. Uh, and this is how one of these photomultipliers uh, looks like. Um, so the fundamental process uh, is, 
what we call a deep inelastic neutrino nucleon scattering. That's how we detect neutrinos. So ice cube is a detector of light. And uh, what we need is to get light out of the neutrino interacting inside the ice. So there's two ways in which this can happen. Either the neutrino interacts with a proton or a neutron, a nucleon in general, by a, a neutral current interaction. So it's changing a Z boson. That means that the incoming neutrino uh, is also the outgoing neutrino, the same, same flavor, or the same process happens, but now mediated by a W boson, so this charge current interaction. Now that the neutrino of a certain flavor uh, becomes a, a, a charged lepton of the same flavor. And in the process, the initial energy of the neutrinos uh, gets split into the, the, the energy of the final state lepton and the final state hadrons. The X represents here final state hadrons, pions, muons, uh, all, all, all the stuff that appears when you break the, the nucleon apart. Uh, so the, the energy, as I said, uh, of the neutrino is split between the final state leptons and the final state hadrons. And all of the energy that is given to charged particles is the energy that eventually uh, is emitted as Cherenkov radiation and that eventually we see uh, so the final state hadrons, uh, that is the, the, the charged ones, they make hadronic showers, which just means that it's a particle shower that contains more pions and muons and neutrons uh, than the shower initiated by a lepton, which contains mainly electrons and photons. Um, and these are the shower, the particle showers that eventually make light and that we see. So from these in fundamental interactions, uh, we see two different uh, topologies of light. So a neutrino comes in from, from some direction and interacts somewhere in the center of this blob, creates a particle shower about 10 meters in size. Uh, and then the, the charged particles inside the shower emit Cherenkov. The Cherenkov light travels for about 100 meters before being attenuated inside the ice, outwards from the interaction vertex. You see more photons deposited in, uh, close to the center where the interaction happened, and then fewer and fewer uh, as, as radially out as the photons uh, attenuate. Uh, this kind of topology is called a shower. Happens when a new E or a new tau interacts uh, in the detector. Um, and the other kind of topology that IceCube sees is called a track. You have the, uh, a new mu interacting. A new mu came in this direction, interacted here, created a shower. The shower in this case is made by the final state hadrons. Remember, you broke up the nucleon, created final state hadrons. They showered and created this shower. But there's also a final state muon that is energetic enough that it can leave uh, the interaction region and, and leave a track of turning of light in its wake. And that is this, this track of here. And so the neutrino came in this direction, interacted here, and then the muon came out. Difference between that one and this one in terms of uh, pointing is this one is, is, is fairly spherical. So the angular resolution is, is 10 degrees or so, or even worse than that. This one, because we have a track then you can point back at the original direction of the neutrino much better, but to one degree of resolution or, or better than that. And from all of this, is, is, uh, we need to infer uh, energies, directions, flavors, and all of that. And there's, as I said, it, oops, something happened here. Uh, this is not changing. Nope. Nope. All right. Yeah, it works. Thanks. So two different topologies from all of these, we infer four observables, energy spectrum, number of neutrinos per interval of energy, uh, available directions, so distribution of, of the incoming directions of the neutrinos in the sky, flavor composition, that is the relative uh, contribution of new e, new mu, new tau, and timing. So if you have a flaring source that emits neutrinos and gamma rays, remember that toy model of neutrino production initially, then they emit them at the same time, then they should arrive and be detected at the same time as well. And of course, if we see any deviation from each one of these four observables, then we can claim something uh, about new physics. Uh, otherwise, we can claim something about how the source of the neutrinos work. OK, so now let me quickly uh, give you a summary of what IceCube has seen in, in about 10 years of working. And, and actually, this is a 7.5 year result, uh, which is one of the latest ones that have been published. So uh, after this amount of time, 
it has seen about 100 contained events. And by that, I mean neutrino, uh, events where the neutrino interacted inside the instrumented volume with a nucleon inside that volume. And above that cut energy of 60 TeV. And if you see here, there are several contributions. This is the number of neutrinos or number of events detected. This is the positive energy, which is roughly neutrino energy. And this is the background of atmospheric muons. This is the background of atmospheric neutrinos. And this is the actual signal in, in yellow, the astrophysical neutrinos. So you see that the data, the, the black points over here, uh, require the existence of this yellow signal in order to be fit well. So the astrophysical neutrino signal is now detected at more than eight sigma. Um, no, so it, it, it is very robustly detected. Um, and not only that, that, the, that data it can be fit pretty well with a simple power law where uh, something that goes as the neutrino energy to some power. If you leave the normalization and the spectral index of that power law free to fit to the data, you find that, just focus on, on, the, on the blue one, you find that the best fit value for the spectral index is roughly 2.9. Uh, and that is surprising that we did not expect it to be so steep. We actually expected something to be closer to two. Remember the proton uh, density that I showed earlier from Fermi acceleration that was closer to e to the minus two and the neutrinos should inherit to some degree that. Uh, so if you use, but, but we found 2.9. However, you use a different data set, not neutrinos that interacted inside a source but neutrinos that interacted close to the source, created a track and the track went through part of the detector, then if you make the same kind of fit, you find something closer to two, about 2.3 or 2.4 or 2.2. Um, so there's some tension there about what the, the shape of the energy spectrum is depending on what data set you use. The tension is at the one or maybe two sigma level, no more than that. It could be something interesting, it could not be. Uh, it's still undecided. All right. Uh, so if you now plot this in a, and I'm going to show this again and again, in a plot of uh, neutrino energy in the x-axis and, and flux times the power of the neutrino energy in the y-axis, this is how these two power laws look. This is the steeper one coming from contained events. This is the, the, the harder one coming from uh, events outside the detector. Yes. One maybe stupid question, like how easy it is to know that these are uh, atmos um, extragalactic just by base, but just by looking at uh, the origin of the direction. Uh, yes. Like so, anisotropy, right? It's like, uh, like we do in uh, ultra, like in charged cosmic rays. Right, right. So their distribution in, in the sky is, is compatible with anisotropic distribution. And that is not what you expect from an atmospheric neutrinos. You expect more atmospheric neutrinos coming from close to the horizon where there's more higher column density of matter where the cosmic rays could interact and therefore make more neutrinos. When you look at these neutrinos, they don't have that excess towards the horizon. It's, it's distributed fairly evenly in the sky. Yeah. It's still, it's much easier to tell how many of them are extragalactic based on the spectrum than it is based on anisotropy. Uh, it's both things. They, okay. Yeah, yeah, at this point it's both things. So not the, the, the spectrum of atmospheric neutrinos falls very fast, like e to the minus 3.7. And the, the spectrum of these astrophysical neutrinos is, is false, of course, with energy, but not as fast. So at some point, spectrum of astrophysical neutrinos will be dominated the, the event uh, collection. Um, so it's both the, the spectrum and the, and the directions. Yeah. All right, so, so that's, that's what we have today. Uh, it's it's uh, the, the spectrum of neutrinos up to a few PeV is one of these, and we don't know exactly which, but. Is, is one of these. And at highest energy, uh, higher energy, sorry, uh, there, there are upper limits on the existence of neutrinos of energies above, above uh, 10 or so PeV coming from ice cube, non-observation of neutrinos of higher energy, and also from Auger, which at that point starts being sensitive to ultra high neutrinos. All right, I'm gonna stop here for a second. Is there any question? I don't see any question, good. There's one question. So when you try to fit this thing with the power law, so the standard astrophysical model is, for example, if you take this Fermi shock model or something like that, it's uh, it's predicts like gamma equals two, right? So is there any way to, or is there any uncertainty in that model so, so that you can have this uh, soft, uh, soft spectrum? Uh, if there, there is an uncertainty in the prediction of the proton spectrum, yes, coming from Fermi acceleration, but it doesn't go as far as making it e to the minus three which is close to what we see. So it's I, I minus 
1, 2.2, or maybe minus 1.9, everything around two, but nowhere near three. And, and we, yeah, I, I don't know, and I don't know if someone knows how to get okay, something okay, so. like that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So that was about energy spectrum. Now let's talk about arrival directions. And, and this is a sky map of, of neutrino excesses in the, in the sky in equatorial coordinates. So this is the galactic center. And uh, if neutrinos were coming from the, from the Milky Way, you would expect them to come from somewhere inside the galactic, close to the galactic center, because that's where most sources are. There's no such excess. So these neutrinos that IceCube sees are definitely not mostly galactic. If there is any galactic neutrinos, it's at most 15% of the diffuse flux. Uh, and not only that, but there's not one position in the sky that is sticking out with sufficient statistical significance to claim an excess or a, a point source, a concentration of point sources in some direction. Uh, there's a recent result where there, there's some claims uh, that there are some steady state sources that are popping out, and that's interesting, but uh, not, in this, not in this particular data set. Uh, so, so far, uh, the distribution of neutrino sources appears to be compatible with an isotropic distribution. And finally, time off, well, no, finally, next timing. Um, and remember I, what I said is some of the sources will make neutrinos, gamma rays, and cosmic rays in the same network of processes. So if they're making gamma rays and neutrinos say inside some jet directed towards us, then if they're made at the same time in the same region under the same conditions, you would expect also to detect those neutrinos and gamma rays at the same time at the earth. Um, we have seen that only a couple of times. And, and the most famous claim, probably the strongest one, is, is this flaring blazer, TXS, or Texas blazer. In 2017, IceCube saw a neutrino of about 300 TV coming from the direction of, of that blazer during a time where that blazer was flaring in gamma rays. So it was a correlated gamma ray neutrino uh, bla uh, flare. And that in itself is like a 1.4 sigma significance of correlation. Uh, and then they looked at their archival data and, and found that uh, in 2014, 15, they found about 13 neutrinos coming from the same direction, but without an associated gamma ray flare. So this is a gamma ray plus neutrino flare from that object. This is a neutrino only flare from the same object. To try to explain both uh, the dynamics of, uh, of both periods uh, under the same model of the physical system in the blazer, uh, it's complicated. So why did you get gamma rays with neutrinos here? And why didn't you get gamma rays over here? We don't know yet. Yeah. So are these flares kind of understood uh, in this business or yes? Where did they come from or? Uh, I mean, blazers flare all the time. Uh, so, so it, the, the fact that they that they that this blazer flare is not surprising. I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so then, why don't you see more? If, because that was particularly energetic. Or... Uh, well, yes. So, so in order to claim a correlation of a neutrino, a high energy neutrino with a particular source, you need to be sure first that there is an astrophysical neutrino. Uh, so, you need to be high enough in energy that the chances of being of this being a atmospheric neutrino are low. And, and second, uh, I mean, you need to be sure that you're associating it to, to the object you're claiming a correlation with. Why then this one was so, um, so clearly seen? It was because yes, it was more energetic or yes, sheer luck that you were pointing there? Or, uh, or, uh, or it was not just more energetic, it was that something happened. That would, uh, so what happened in this particular one that made it so uh, well correlated? Right. So, as I said, blazers flare all the time, but they don't emit neutrinos. We don't detect neutrinos from them all the time. This is the first time it has happened. Why this one in particular, we do not know. Yeah. Um, it could be that, that this is a population of, of uh, mid luminosity sources that will flare now and then. And this is the first time in 10 years that we happen to see one instance of the population. Yeah. Uh, and we don't know because it's the only instance we have, we have actually seen a correlation in. But this is, this is uh, being worked out. Okay, and finally, the fourth observable that I wanted to talk about is uh, uh, flavor. And uh, the general picture here is uh, we have astrophysical sources making neutrinos. And remember, if you have them make, made by uh, proton photon interactions, you get two million neutrinos per each electron neutrino produced. I'm not distinguishing between neutrinos and antineutrinos. You know, neutrinos oscillate, they mix uh, during propagation to the Earth, and that propagation is over several gigaparsecs, maybe. And the standard expectation is that even if you start with 
two mu neutrinos per each electron neutrino, at Earth, you end up having equal amount of each uh, flavor. And we uh, describe this transition between source and Earth in, in, in terms of uh, the, the flavor ratio. So it's the proportion of electron, muon, and tau neutrinos in the incoming neutrino flux. And because we know how neutrino oscillations work from, from oscillation experiments, coming from solar atmospheric reactor uh, accelerator data, then we know if we have an expectation for how these neutrinos are made. So what is the flavor ratios? Uh, what are the flavor ratios of neutrinos coming out of the sources? We can convolve that with a transition probability of say an electron neutrino surviving into an electron neutrino or changing into a mu neutrino or changing into a tau neutrino and then calculating what the expected flavor ratios are at the earth. We do that, then we go from two mu neutrinos per each electron neutrino to one, one, one. So same amount of each flavor. Let's look at that in a bit more detail. Oh, one more thing I should say is here, there's opportunity to put in new physics because we know how to calculate these standard oscillations, but it's also easy to change them if we want to test some new interaction that is flavor changing. All right, uh, so I'm gonna show several of these pictures, these Ternary plots. And, and what this shows is uh, uh, any point in sight has to have coordinates that are up to one. And each, each side represents a different flavor, nu e, nu mu, nu tau. So if I put a point there, oh, sorry, uh, in each corner is pure neutrino, uh, pure flavor. So this is pure nu e, that's pure nu tau. This is, uh, this is, sorry, this is pure nu mu, and this is pure nu tau. If you have point, a point in sight, uh, if you want to find what the flavor ratios of that point is, I just have to follow the tilt of the tick marks. So this is 20% nu e. Uh, horizontally is 60% nu mu, and then the remaining 20% is, is by default nu tau. Uh, and of course, if it's in the center, then I get one third of each flavor, and that's going to be an important point in a second. And later, I'm going to show not only points, but also regions inside the triangle. All right, so the, as I said, the picture is we start with some production process, and we can make a guess about how neutrinos are made. But then we know how to calculate uh, flavor oscillations, uh, but these depend on, on four mixing parameters, which are the ones that are measured by oscillation experiments. In particular, three mixing angles and one CP violation phase. And these have certain values with uh, some uncertainties. But for now, let's assume that we know the values of those parameters perfectly well. Um, so let's go back to our toy model of neutrino production. Proton photon interactions give us uh, muons and new mus, and then the, new, and the muons decay further. And at the end of the whole chain, if we follow it through, we get two mu neutrinos per each electron neutrino mate, and no tau neutrinos. Essentially, we don't make tau neutrinos in astrophysical sources. So if we put that point in a triangle, it's in this axis, the axis of, of uh, zero new tau. Uh, and then if we turn on oscillations from the sources to the Earth and assume that we know perfectly well the neutrino mixing parameters, we end up somewhere very close to the center of the triangle. So again, that's the nominal expectation of having equal amount of each flavor. We can start from somewhere else in the pure new mu corner over there. And that could happen, for instance, if this muon over here loses energy significantly by synchrotron radiation in a source that has a very high magnetic field. So that by the time it decays, the neutrinos that it makes are low energy compared to the high energy neutrino coming directly from the pion decay. So the only high energy neutrino in this case is a new mu. So we start from this corner and then we move to the earth and we're a little off center. And then we can start from a more exotic scenario of having only new E bars coming from neutral decay. We start from this corner, oscillate, and end up towards the right of the triangle. Again, remember, I'm assuming that we know perfectly well how oscillations work or how the, or the values of the neutrino mixing parameters, and that is not true. And I'm going to say more about this later. All right. How am I doing in time? 10 minutes? Yeah. OK, then I'm, I'm going to skip a lot. Uh, Okay, so uh, let's, let's look at a big picture of this. Uh, there's a lot of different ways in which uh, neutrino physics can be changed at the highest energies. I'm gonna I'm just wrote my favorite models over there. Some of them are recognizable, like uh, sterile active neutrino mixing, uh, dark matter decay, the annihilation, uh, long range interaction, supersymmetry, et cetera. And uh, you can arrange all of these models and it's instructive to do so along two axes. And the first one is the axis of where they act. They can act like production, and so inside the sources themselves, or they can act during propagation. And remember that the power to test new physics comes most comes also from the, the fact that we have very long baseline between sources and, and, and um, detector. So those are the neutrino uh, new physics models that can be uh, 
we can expect to be uh, better bound by using these neutrinos. And finally, they can also act at the detector. And by that, I mean inside the Earth or inside um, the detector itself. And the other axis along which we can arrange these uh, models is what observable out of the four that I showed earlier, they affect. Uh, it could be energy spectrum, lateral directions, for the working position, or the timing. And of course, each one of them can affect more than one of these observables. So this uh, uh, apparently nightmarish picture of the theory landscape is actually just a, a, a demonstration of the fact that we have a lot of rich space to test. Um, and if you want to know more about this, I can just point you to reviews. So uh, this is what we have to work with now. These are, these are the power law uh, fluxes that we have from IceCube. But uh, so from these, as I said, we're turning them, uh, these predictions that existed before the discovery into data-driven tests. We're, begin, we're building bigger detectors to get larger statistics, improving the reconstruction, removing some of the astrophysical uncertainties, thanks to talking to our uh, friends in astrophysics. Uh, but it is interesting to think what we can do at higher energies where we don't have any data yet. I think this stopped again. No, no, this, this stopped. I cannot, I cannot transition. There we go. So it's interesting to think what we can do with uh, even higher energy neutrinos. And, and then it becomes a bit of a mess because we don't have data. The most natural thing to do, of course, is just extrapolate those power laws that we know exist up to infinitely high energies. And that's the easiest thing, but that is probably too simple. And we actually, from Arjun's talk, we saw that there's better ways to do things. Uh, so in the next 10 years or so, maybe 20, we will have sensitivity down to this level. These are the upper limits today. This is a sensitivity we can get from a new experiment, IceCube Gen 2, uh, in, in, after running 10 years. Uh, and at that point, we can start testing uh, different kinds of, of, of uh, flux predictions for the neutrinos. This is one that is very low below sensitivity, so we probably wouldn't be able to discover those neutrinos, but there's many of those. Some of these are below sensitivity, some of these are above, saturating the upper bounds. And all of these come from different assumptions about the sources, and the, the way the cosmogenic neutrinos are made. Some of these are ultra high energy neutrinos made at the sources. Some of this, uh, them are ultra high energy neutrinos made by cosmic rays interacting with the CMB. And because we don't know, because we don't have data in this energy range, then we don't know what the flux is. So planning for the next 10, 20 years where we hope to detect this, these neutrinos uh, is, is, a, is an ongoing process today. And if we reach about the level that we hope we can reach, then we actually can probe uh, everything above this dash dotted line. So it's a big part of the primary space. And not only that, it's a bit more complicated. I mean, these neutrinos are, the fluxes are different for neutrinos and antineutrinos and for different flavors. So it, it's a difficult prediction to make that is uh, taken into account today when we're planning for the next generation of detectors. Okay, so planning for the next decade when we hopefully will detect a, uh, neutrinos of 100 PeV of energy or more, uh, we are making predictions to date today for what we can do in the next 10 years. And the first thing we want is discovery to actually have neutrinos. Uh, we are developing new detection techniques. I was talking about how IceCube works. IceCube is good for PEV neutrinos or so. Not so good if we want to go to 1,000 PEV. And the reason is we would need to have a detector that is uh, too expensive to build. We have to build too many holes in the ice. It is easier to go to other technologies that don't use optical detection, but rather radio detection. So the same showers that are created when neutrinos interact inside the, inside the ice and may light uh, at higher energies also make coherent radio emission that propagate in the ice with an even longer attenuation length than, than uh, light. So they can travel for far longer. So it's easier to build antennas buried in the ice radio antennas, uh, rather than put photomultipliers there in the ice. And you can cover a larger volume doing, doing that with radio. That's what I meant. And there's all the detection techniques, looking at fluorescence emission from, the, from outside the Earth, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we are also improving those neutrino flux predictions that you saw uh, in a previous slide, and also you saw in Arjun's talk earlier. Uh, so all of these have to, all of these predictions, and also inferring new physics from the current data have to be made robust and, and meaningful 
by doing something that we perhaps have not been done very well up to now, which is accounting for all the relevant particle physics and astrophysical uncertainties that wash away in the sensitivity. So the way I like to think about this is that today in, 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 in high energy neutrino physics, where the similar stage that uh, cosmology was in the beginning of the 90s, where it was becoming a high precision field and eventually will become what, we, what it is now. Um, it's just a matter of actually including all this stuff. Very well. So uh, I won't have time to talk about specifics like flavor stuff and cross-section stuff, uh, but let me just say uh, what will come in, what we're doing today about getting new physics out of flavor uh, composition measurements and, and talking to the low energy experiments in order to improve these measurements. And what we're doing now to extract cross-section measurements uh, at the PV range and making predictions for the EV range is very exciting. Uh, in, in the sense that we actually are reaching, in, in some instances, uh, the same level of precision you would expect from uh, accelerator experiments, but at thousands of times energies uh, above what we can do in accelerator experiments. So uh, I think I'm almost out of time, three minutes. So uh, let me stop now. And uh, if anybody is interested in looking at and talking about flavor stuff and cross your stuff with high neutrinos, I'll be happy to talk. But otherwise, uh, thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks, Mauricio. Any questions from the audience? Uh, from yeah. I have a question. So, if you think about the ice cube uh, as a particle collider, so can you say something about uh, dark matter production there? In principle, it's like it's a, it, it's a wimp or something. It's dark matter is a wimp or something like that inside the ice cube or just. Yeah. So I mean, then, so I mean, I don't know how this scales, but you know, if you have such, you have such high energy events, there's some collision inside there. And could you, in principle, produce dark matter in that? Uh, um, and if we have some other form of... Uh... In, in principle, yes. Uh, but I mean, the way accelerators look for dark matter is typically by looking at missing energy. And this, this experiment is not a precision experiment. So missing energy is as high as you want because you mostly don't see things uh, at, the, at the level of detail that you would like to see in order to test it. Uh, so that is not the best way to look for dark matter inside ice cube. No, direct production, yeah, uh, I, but you can look, for instance, at the result of uh, dark matter annihilating into into uh, into neutrinos, and if they annihilate around a certain or they decay uh, mainly around a certain energy, then you would get a bump in the neutrino spectrum around the energy where those neutrinos would appear. And you can go and look in the data and see if you have a bump. And uh, if you do, you can attribute that to uh, dark matter decay into neutrinos. If you don't, you can put a limit on the cross-section versus mm -hmm. mass plane. And in fact, there is an excess in towards the TV range of the neutrino data that have, has been interpreted as a potential dark matter signal. Yeah, but so it, it's to put balance on dark matter in ice cube is, is mostly indirect. Direct production, I don't think that can be done. Other questions uh, from the audience? Uh, Diego? Yeah, uh, talking about robustness, is there a kind of synergetic uh, process in which, by studying the different, I mean, some you want favor, favor BSM process, which really, I mean, it has an impact on the different kind of channels that you are studying, and you would say this, you see, it's like yes. uh, can only be this thing. Yes. Uh, okay, I think I, I can move my, the slides here, right? No. Yeah. Okay. So. Then let me let me see if I can go exactly to where I want to show you. Uh, see, this is all the good flavor stuff that I'm skipping. Okay, this is what I want to show. So there's there's a lot of different possible uh, models that can change the flavor composition and can deviate it from the one 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 expectation that I was talking about. And when you explore what the effect is then let's let's focus on on one uh, let's focus on on this one so I, i've been talking about neutrino oscillations and, and that i meant in, in really uh neutrino new e new mu and new tau oscillating into one another if there's an extra species of neutrinos that you can oscillate into then uh the expectation of getting at the earth equal amount of new e new mu and new tau 
can be broken. It depends on the, on the size of the mixing, of course. If the mixing of the active neutrinos with the new species of neutrinos is high, then some of these active neutrinos can leak out and then you wouldn't see them in ice cube. And so you would expect something different. Um, if that were to happen, then the nominal expectation of one, one, one and any error around it coming from uh, the uncertainty of the mixing parameters, uh, you would get very much away from that. You can get as far away as, as actually being at Earth in one of the corners. You would get an, uh, only a pure new mu flux at the Earth versus the standard expectation of having equal amount of new new mu tau. And that is because during the propagation, the active neutrinos leaked out and became something that is unobservable by ice cube. So yes, you can have huge deviations uh, on, on the flavor composition expected at the Earth when you turn on this these new physics effects. And that is just one possibility of, of non-unitarity in, in the mixing. You can have Lorentz and CPT invariance violation and essentially you get the same kind of results. You can have non-standard interactions of the neutrinos when they travel through the earth uh, and all the way to the detector. In, as I said, you can have active shot neutrino mixing or you can have some weird new uh, lepton number violating uh, electron uh electron neutrino interactions and in all these cases you can end up very far away from the standard expectation of being at the center of a triangle yeah and uh whether maybe your question was if i if i were to measure if my standard expectation is to be over here but i were to measure something over here is there one unique model well, the question is, can you then look at another, another observable that will allow you to pin down that this is uh, in some so cases you can it, in your previous transparency, you were showing it, you know, that there are some models that impact the four corners. Yeah. And I wonder which is the best, the model that would really say that this really has impact in the flavor composition, in the, maybe in the propagation, but you know, in, in all this. In, in, in some cases you can, for instance, if you have new neutrino, neutrino interactions, and those new interactions are flavor dependent. So new E bars have a new interaction with, with new mu's and new tau's and new E's that is different for each one then you will affect, yes, the flavor triangle. You won't end up in the center, but you will end up somewhere else. But you will also potentially introduce uh, some spectral features in the, in the power law. So if this interaction between neutrinos of different flavor is resonant, then you will expect fewer neutrinos at around the resonance energy once you make a measurement of neutrino spectrum. Uh, because those neutrinos would have interacted along the way and not arrived at the Earth. And then you would also expect maybe some uh, some anisotropy, depending exactly on, on what the interaction is sourced by. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely some some cases where you have more than one observable that can help. Uh, so uh, do we have um, uh, questions? From, I do not see questions from Zoom. But uh, may I ask a very uh, naive question? So uh, with PV neutrinos, as far as I understand, in principle, you can explain by blizzards. Uh, there are some uh, Uncertainties about no uh, PV neutrinos. We can you you cannot explain it by lasers. You cannot. Yeah. So the, let me let me clarify very quickly. Uh, this is the one the one I show the Texas blazer. Mm -hmm. That's the one time we have seen one neutrino associated to one blazer. Mm -hmm. If all the neutrinos were coming from blazers of this sort, the diffuse flux that we see would be several times higher than the flux that we actually see. So that means that when you actually go into your data and make a correlation of the neutrino positions with the positions of blazers in the sky, turns out that the contribution of the population of blazers to the diffuse flux can be at most, I think it's 20%. And that is an upper limit. So there's, there's no correlation really. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'll make that clarify. So it, uh, as far as I remember seven years ago or something, this was the main viewpoint that they came from blazers and then it, something has changed in this area uh, or it has never been considered. You might be thinking about the OJ uh, correlation. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, but not in, not in neutrinos. Okay, okay. No, not neutrinos, yeah. Uh, so, so far, as I said, there's only one, one case okay. where one neutrino okay. was correlated. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Okay, uh, uh, if no more question, let's thank Mauricio again for this excellent talk.